Uh, Daniel, great to be here with you. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh. I'm one of our customer experience consultants at User Testing. Uh, I get to work with our customer success managers and our customers, helping them with a lot of their strategic initiatives uh, with regard to user testing. Uh, so I am excited to chat with Daniel today. Um, so before we dive into this conversation, Daniel, could you just kind of give us a, a brief introduction to your background and uh, how do you how do you get to to a partner list? Yeah, thank you, Laura and, and Josh, for having me on LinkedIn Live for user testing. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join this session. Uh, my name is Daniel, and uh, I'm a UX research manager at Apartment List, and I'm part of uh, Apartment List's design team. Um, and I joined Apartment List pre-pandemic as the first dedicated UX researcher to kind of really shape our product to help renters find the home they love and deserve, but at the same time help clients uh, find the find right renters at the right time for their property. So a brief introduction of what I do at Apartment List, Josh. Awesome. Uh, well, so based on what Laura had, had said in the, the article that you wrote, um, we just want to kind of dive into to some thoughts and, and uh, some of your takes on how you've brought empathy into to your team uh, based on like how you actually perform as a UX researcher. So um, I guess just to start with, can you tell us a little bit about joining a, a apartment list pre-pandemic and then how that that move to, to a remote team, because you guys were still very all very new um, and then you know, how, how do you build a remote culture of, of, of trust and camaraderie? Um, yeah, just kind of kind of just start on the journey there. Yeah, that's a really great question because um, I've experienced both both sides of uh, uh, the, the experience there. Uh, so as I mentioned, I joined Apartment List in 2019, so right before the pandemic, and uh, I got to experience both the in-office and uh, remote cultures. and. We actually decided to go uh, fully remote and really embrace the remote first culture last December. Uh, and we're also uh, working and hire, hiring entirely remotely as well. Um, what I noticed, Josh, in this transition is that I, I noticed two significant changes in our culture. Uh, first, we created a level playing field in how we interact with each other in meetings. Uh, embracing remote first culture kind of de-emphasized the advantage of being in, in person in the office and, and provided everyone uh, with an equal opportunity to express their thoughts. I remember working from home, uh, being on the screen in the meeting room, not being able to voice my thoughts uh, as strongly as I wanted to uh, had I been in the office. Uh, the other thing that I noticed was that we created a, a level playing field in hiring. Uh, hiring remotely really allowed us to bring diverse perspectives and voices uh, by sourcing talent from regions outside of the Bay Area and from varying industries and, and backgrounds. So it was really interesting to kind of observe this uh, this transition that we made, Josh. Okay, so so to give us kind of an idea of like the, the scale, when you started, you were a team of one, how many designers were you working with and just what was the, how many people did you hire? How did you grow the team? What was that, that part like? Yeah, so right before the pandemic, I was uh, a research team of one. <laughs> so supporting all teams uh, throughout the organization. Uh, there were three designers. Um, actually, we hired, um, at the time we uh, started working from home, uh, our, our uh, third member of the design team. Uh, and now, as we've gone remote, we've been hiring uh, designers uh, from other places as, as well. So my most, our most recent hire is actually from Wisconsin, so it's great to you know, bring in the, the Midwestern perspective as well, uh, in, in adding to the, uh, the bi-coastal kind of experience we bring to the table in the design team. Awesome. Um, so, you know, typically when you're in person, you can, you, you have the time to spend together, you can do in-person outings, you can have team events, and that, that really helps build cohesion and trust within your, your small teams. Um, so what were some of the things that you kind of started to do um, or, or how did you just even approach that, that, that problem from, okay, we're all remote now. Uh, we, we still need to have that same trust and cohesion. How do, how do we build that? So what were some of the things that you, you kind of brought into your team or the, the practices that you started to do? Yeah, that's a really great question and something that is super important to me. Um, 
building a strong relationship in in the design team is is my priority because it's it's critical uh, to forge trust in the team to to cultivate empathy for each other. And what's really amazing, um, as we're talking about kind of the transition from in office to 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 remote first, uh, our shift in that really opened up opportunities to dedicate even more time to get together with more intention. So whereas before we would you know tap on someone's shoulder and have a casual chat, now we make it uh, our priority to get together and actually dedicate some time to to do this. Um, so while it might be helpful to be, you know, physically together with your roommate, or sorry, not roommates, teammates, that's how close I feel uh, to, to my team. Um, but it's it's much more important for everyone to be mentally present together. So this means, you know, getting to know each other at a more intimate level and being genuinely curious about how, how they think and why they think the way they do, as, as researchers like to always pose their questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in, in terms of just kind of uh, being intentional, what were what were some of the the types of uh, meetings or outings, or what were what were kind of some of the things that you set up um, to 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 force that intentionality, or just to to bring that out? Yeah. So, um, one of the most important things that I I think the design design team should have is empathy. And so these are kind of activities that we do to uh, foster that empathy. And that's important because uh, our product designers are really at the forefront of designing the best experience for our renters and clients. And uh, one of the critical steps that designers take to create this experience is to frame how we're solving for the problem that we've observed in the real world. Um, so, you know, kind of going, moving from uh, understanding how to uh, empathize with others. It was also crucial that the design team understood the importance of empathic framing in approaching these questions. Um, so this kind of meant that we would actually write our problem statements that we're solving for, that is product and solution agnostic and based on real world research. Uh, so for example, instead of framing the problem as, how do we get users to contact properties more? Uh, we would instead think of it as, how might we help renters feel more confident in their decision to get in touch with a property? Uh, and this kind of framing comes from the, the activities that we do uh, on a weekly basis in the design team. Um, and this brings about kind of really being curious about the context in which renters make decisions and uh, wanting to learn more about the goals they want to achieve, uh, which takes a tremendous amount of empathy. Um, so as, as I kind of talked about previously, a lot of what we do in team bonding is, is really just being genuinely curious about how our teammate thinks and uh, why they think the way they do. Um, and I've learned through this experience and previous experience as well that uh, what's really great about empathy is that it is something that can be practiced and developed. So the more our team spends time becoming better listeners uh, again, with intentionality and with intention uh, and being curious about each other, the more we uh, learn to be more empathetic and the more we can take that to apply to our approach uh, for problem solving and the product that we're building. Interesting. So I, I know we're very comfortable as researchers you know, building empathy and, and understanding our users like you talked about. Um, but when you're tran you're turning that, that focus on your, on your colleagues, I, I feel like that might be a little bit of a different uh, experience for most of us. So how did you translate the, the, the skills and abilities that you have as a researcher, establishing empathy for, for your participants into building empathy with your, with your colleagues and also how to teaching them you know, the, the same practices for empathy? Yes, I love that question. <laughs> Anything that I can do to uh, socialize and evangelize empathy. Um, and I'd love to share a kind of really approachable way to foster this type of empathy within your team. And um, for everyone listening, this is probably something you do already at, at work. Uh, it's just an icebreaker, but it's not just any icebreaker because you'll ask the why behind your teammates' answers. And as researchers, you know how important it is to ask why. 
more often. Um, so for example, one of my ice, uh, ice, favorite icebreakers I asked my teammates was, what color do you see yourself as? And as a follow-up, what color do you want to be? Strange questions, right? <laughs> so to kind of um, explore this further, I'll let Josh ask me th this question or these questions, and I'll answer it live here so you have a better understanding of how this might go in your actual icebreaker. So Josh. OK, so here we go. We're in a meeting. We're, we're establishing empathy. So, so Daniel, what color do you see yourself as? Hmm, Josh, that's a great question. Let me think about that. Uh, I, I see myself as ocean blue. Ocean blue, why, why, is, why ocean blue? Hmm. Uh, I think it's because I like to see myself as someone who's, who's calm, maybe open-hearted and optimistic. Okay, so what color would you want to be? Hmm, that's even a deeper question. <laughs> Uh, I want to be cobalt blue. Cobalt blue. That that's that's an interesting twist. What what about what about cobalt blue? Yeah, uh, it's you know as much as I love being you know composed like the ocean blue, but uh, I I also want to be more inspiring, more electric and energetic. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Josh, for walking through the, the, the question answer with me there. Um, so, so this icebreaker, by asking these two simple questions and asking why after, you can really learn about how your teammates see themselves as and who they aspire to be. Um, the, the example here that we showed you uh, with the role playing or with Josh stopped at the first why, but there are other activities that you can do to go even deeper and really f fully embrace the five whys. Or even just if you have more time with your teammates, if your team's up, you know, is small in size, well, you can continue on and ask him why uh, someone wanted to be energetic, for example. Uh, was there a, I'm gonna sidetrack us here a little bit, but was there a, a resource that you found for good icebreaker questions or did you just kind of come up with these on your own or, or where, where do you, where do you kind of find the, the questions to, to start that, that deeper empathy and, and getting to know one another? That's a really great question uh, because I get asked uh, that as well from my teammates. <laughs> uh, what's funny, it, it comes just naturally from, um, from uh, a walk that my partner and I would take, you know, just talking about things. Uh, thinking about uh, different questions that we ask ourselves. So um, a lot of introspection is involved in kind of formulating these types of questions. And uh, we kind of bounce off of each other's ideas and as well as uh, ask, our, ask each other uh, what our answers are. And this is something that I want to also ask my teammates as well, because I realized that you do so much introspection by thinking about these questions. So my source of inspiration for these questions are from my partner uh, and um, podcasts as well, like, like Hidden Brain is something that I listen to pretty often um, where I get the idea of asking different type of, types of questions to ask my teammates so to understand, uh, to better understand uh, and empathize with how they think as well. So take more walks. <laughs> I'm looking through the chat and uh, somebody said their, their go-to question is always, what is your favorite cheese? So maybe in your next icebreaker, you can, you can delve into the, the aspects of cheese with your, with your team. Yeah, you know what's funny is, um, you know, everything that we talk about is a reflection of our, our inner self, right? So even if you ask someone, what is your favorite type of cheese? you can ask them why and really get to the deep end of their psyche <laughs> and understand that their really true core motivation for liking or disliking a, a particular type of cheese. So it's a fun one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, to get, a bit, get us back on track here a little bit. Um, so you, you, you've kind of started to do this with, with your immediate design team. Um, but now I'm kind of curious, have you been able to expand this outside to uh, other colleagues within other departments and kind of, you know, build empathy across department lists uh, outside of your team and just, just kind of create a, a, a more empathetic culture? Yes, uh, super important question. 
And yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, as everyone probably knows, it's important to recognize that product managers um, are at the helm of making decisions based on business and user needs. So it's super critical for PMs to set their quarterly goals or their vision or their mission uh, based on a set of user problems on top of business metrics. And um, to help PMs really understand firsthand what it, what it is like to frame opportunity space beyond the product and feature attributes, I, I invite them to, to participate in a live kind of a generative interview session. So kind of similar to what Josh and I did earlier <laughs> with PMs. Um, so let me kind of describe what this looks like. So in this session, I talk about some of the do's and don'ts and asking questions. So uh, like avoiding leading questions, future-based questions, uh, questions that are double-barreled, uh, yes or no questions, uh, along with some of the techniques that you can use to probe further. Uh, so asking questions without asking them. Um, and after I talk about you know, asking these right questions, we jump right into a live interview session uh, in which PMs will pair up to be the interviewer and interviewee. Um, and so in this particular scenario, the interviewing PM is really acting as a researcher like myself, conducting generative research to provide strategic insights based on the business prompt that I prepare <laughs> as a PM. Um, <clears throat> and, and the interviewee uh, PM who is, who is being interviewed is assuming the role of the participant. So two PMs, one interviewer, researcher PM, and interviewee, participant PM. So to give you an example of kind of the prompt that I prepared, uh, here's an example. La Lista is a local startup of espresso aficionados in Seattle that builds high-tech home espresso machines. Um, the product experience team at La Lista wants to acquire amateur baristas with its low-end machine by providing barista training program through its digital interface. And the co-founder and the PM, they want to know what content the training pro program should provide. So this is the type of prompt that I would provide to PM, something a PM would come up with. Um, and with this prompt, I also guide them to start with an open-ended question of, you know, like, tell me about your most recent experience of making an espresso. Then uh, I, I start the timer for 15 minutes and get the live interview going <laughs> between the two PMs. It's super interesting to observe this. Um, and my role here uh, is to intervene only whenever the interviewer asks questions that are part of the, the don'ts and kind of course correct the conversation so the PMs can learn as they go what types of questions are leading, what types of questions are future-based, double-barreled, double and, and so on. Um, and what I realized is that the PMs really embrace this exercise. Uh, it's super fun. It's kind of like a, almost like a team bonding exercise. Um, and they you know, successfully ask multiple whys to get to the core value of the interviewee's experience. And in, in this particular uh, session that I had with PMs, uh, and from this prompt, I actually learned that our head of product, who doesn't drink coffee at all, uh, actually puts a lot of effort to, to making a beautiful latte art as a gesture of care and love for his partner. And we're all blown away. <laughs> we never realized why he made espresso dreams every day. Um, and it's it's probably a theme that you know probably would have never made it to the list of hypotheses at La Lista. So it's it's so wonderful to be able to kind of um, work with PMs for them to kind of go through this experience of being a researcher, being a participant in in the research. Awesome. Uh, a couple follow up questions here. Um, you know, it, it sounds like you have very receptive product managers who are, are kind of bought into the process and want to participate. Um, how, how might you go about uh, broaching the subject with maybe PMs who are maybe less receptive or I'm too busy or, you know, maybe some of those common objections uh, that we hear as researchers. Um, did you experience any of that? Do you have any, any insight in how to to kind of build this into your process a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's something that uh, 
you know, we as researchers have to think about uh, all the time to get, you know, stakeholder buy-in for research. And something that I've done that was pretty successful is first, not assuming that PMs understand why it's important to conduct research or uh, have the, the, the set of knowledge that we do uh, about the, the power of research. So setting up a kind of a, a, a intro to UXR deck uh, with describing like what are, like what are uh, evaluative research and, and generative research and when are they used? When do you use them? How do you uh, use them to improve our product? And just kind of going through the general, like the one-on-one uh, research 101 through PMs is a good start because they may not have the information that we have and, and know um, very well. So that's something uh, that I, I've done with PMs to uh, onboard into the world of research and uh, provide examples, right? So one of the presentations that I give, I always use myself <laughs> as an example. So when I'm talking about generative research and asking why, I actually use an example of how I bought an iron and an ironing board <laughs> and uh, did my kind of a, you know, self interview. Again, I, I um, volunteered uh, one of the PMs to ask me some of the questions that I put on the presentation to ask me why I bought an iron, uh, which kind of led to me wanting to be uh, someone who's dependable and I bought this specific iron. So at that point, um, it kind of clicked with PMs that, hey, you know, we're not really optimizing for the, the product attributes. We really want to help our, our users get to where they're going by providing the right solution for the right problem space. So that's the first step that I would go um, with PMs to uh, just create a space for like research education. Awesome. Um, so I, I guess the next question that I'll, that I'll follow up with is, as you've done more of this training, I, I can only assume that this has a larger impact across apartment list as a whole. So how, how has this kind of helped you um, and your team kind of start shifting the company culture to kind of move to that user problem first uh, understanding of, of how to, to go about building products and features for, for both your uh, listers and renters? How, how does that kind of translate? Yeah, I love that question. Uh, kind of related to what I talked about, you know, of doing intro to UXR type of sessions. Uh, I, I realized that socializing, uh, you know, how we might become better listeners, uh, embracing kind of our inner child like curiosity and and practicing empath empathic thinking really brought a, a sea change in how a permanentist thinks about approaching real world problems, as you kind of mentioned. Um, and the shift from really just optimizing for metrics to helping renters and clients in the context of, of um, their real world environment gave the team's clear objective and, and sense of um, sense of vision to work towards and, and a sense of fulfillment with the work they've done to really bring joy to renters and, and clients. And that's super important for team morale to really understand uh, why they're doing the work they're doing. And, and uh, bringing in that empathic framing is super powerful uh, for, for the teammates developing the product. Um, and one of the things that I love doing is sharing these moments of delight that our renters and clients have with our product team uh, through kind of user testing videos that I would clip <laughs> and put into my readout deck and, and kind of see everyone's faces light up, everyone's smiling, and it's just great to know that they uh, kind of see firsthand what their work has produced. Uh, the kind of contribution they've made in launching the product um, it made their hard work worth it by seeing uh, how renters and clients are enjoying it. Awesome. Well, as we kind of uh, come up on the, the tail end of the hour here, um, just kind of one final thought, maybe one one suggestion from you is, um, say, you know, anybody watching this um, and, and they kind of want to take some of these things away and, and try them and apply them to their own teams. Um, what's, what's the one thing that you would suggest people trying um, as they as they try to create empathy in this remote culture uh, with with their colleagues and their and their teammates. It's an awesome question and something that's super relevant <laughs> in in our remote environment, especially uh, as I've kind of alluded. I've been kind of incredibly blessed to work in a culture that acknowledges and embraces the the importance of diverse voices, cultures, and perspectives. So uh, kind of 
and related to that, when I describe the culture that we have at our partner list, I use three words to do it. It's transparency, communication, and empathy. And again, this is to highlight how blessed I am to be in this environment. But I, I also recognize that that is not the case for everyone, um, for every researcher. And um, the, every researcher doesn't have the luxury of having the full support from the organization or from the team to invest in, in resources to conduct you know, larger generative studies or to even ev evangelize empathy throughout the organization. So in this situation, I, I, I want to advocate everyone to remember that your empathy for your stakeholder uh, goes a long way too. Uh, as kind of as I kind of talked about, it, it just takes patience uh, uh, in uh, evangelizing what it means to be totally empathetic. So also kind of utilize that and try to understand um, what your PMs, what your uh, engineers, what your designers might be um, faced with, uh, and their barriers and pain points as well. So you can actually uh, provide tangible. Um, tangible results from your, your research as well. So uh, in order to kind of evangelize empathy at a larger scale, I would say start small. Um, as I talked about, weekly icebreakers work really well to build rapport and relationship based on trust. Um, and I as mentioned, really understand their goals and motivations and what they want to achieve um, in their position, in their environment, and identify their pain points and barriers in, in their roles. Uh, this is something that we ex excel at researchers, so I'm sure it's not a, uh, not a huge barrier for you. Um, and after you kind of understood their context in which they operate, communicate how you might make their lives better with your research in initiatives. Um, and as a kind of like a final note, uh, I, I like to remind everyone that, you know, building and evangelizing empathy takes patience. It takes practice and it takes persistence. So just remember to embrace the power of listening and uh, treat every interaction with genuine curiosity. And that's, uh, I think, the biggest takeaway that, uh, from this session. Awesome. Well, uh, we are at the top of the hour. So, Daniel, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us today, giving us some insight and pointers on uh, how to have empathy for our colleagues and our stakeholders and how much that's going to impact the, the cultures that we're all, we all find ourselves in. Um, if there was any questions that we didn't answer in the chat, we will go back and provide answers to those. Um, again, highly recommend uh, go read Daniel's Medium post. Uh, we'll post that in the comments too. Um, but yeah, take what he uh, graciously gave us today. Go start practicing some icebreakers with your team. Uh, start small, start building empathy. Uh, you'll be amazed at what it can do. So uh, with that, Daniel, thank you again. It's been uh, a great pleasure talking to you and everybody have a great weekend. Thanks, Josh, for having me. Of course.